it's working. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for joining us today on our first post talk live. Um, for those thank who you haven't, me. you're welcome. Um, for those who, who haven't come to a in-person uh, post-talk salon, uh, we've done them in New York and San Francisco and LA and Washington, Shoreditch and London, the Arctic. Um, that was a little bit more of a trek. Uh, the, po the point of these salons is to gather people, both either online or in person, and build community, build a community of curious people. Uh, folks from all different generations and all different backgrounds, different press, um, but really the point is to build a community of curious people and, and put folks together um, to have a conversation and, and to uh, get to know each other and to kick ideas around. Um, so, so Mary has, has joined us um, and we've thrown out questions to her both in, in New York and uh, recently in LA and I thought she would be a great person um, in this era of the new era of the pandemic um, to join us on our first salon. So thank you so much for joining Mary. Thank you, Susan. Uh, in the last salons in New York and LA, it was de rigueur to have a glass of wine. So it is eight o'clock here in London and I wanted to keep the spirit. Um, someone today was saying that we shouldn't say social distancing anymore because we want to keep the social part. So I say hats off to post talk for allowing us to um, do physical distancing, but keep socially connected. So oh, cheers. Uh Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, so Mary's background is she is a whistleblower attorney and she's um, practiced for over 20 years. She's with Constantine Cannon um, in London, uh, but was based for a long time in, in San Francisco. And her background includes, uh, which she can tell us more about um, herself, but uh, she's done a lot of work uh, around the healthcare system, She's worked on cases such as Theranos, and recently her firm's worked on the Boeing case. And I was asking her earlier, how much money had they retrieved? And it's hundreds of millions, maybe up to a billion. It's a lot of, of money that um, they've retrieved um, for whistleblowers, right? So yes, we have our firm and there's a bunch of us with, uh, we're a little long in the tooth uh, and gray at the temples, but uh, we have over a hundred years be amongst us um, and between us for representing whistleblowers and our cases on behalf of whistleblowers have helped return um, close to a billion dollars to the United States Treasury and to the SEC and CFTC and other agencies trying to um, uh, deal with and, and enforce their, their goals and their aims, their agency wow. aims. So whistleblowing, um, I mean, you're in the UK and we, we know the laws are different there, but whistleblowing has been around in America since since the late 1700s, right? That's, that's right. So yeah. the primary statute we, is called the False Claims Act and it's called Lincoln's Law. And it was adopted it called? Sorry. Lincoln's Law. Uh, Lincoln's Law, of course, after Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. After good Abraham Lincoln. And the notion was that we wanted to incentivize insiders who would know about war profiteering. So if you worked at um, a boot manufacturers, there were people selling the Union Army boots made of cardboard. They were selling gunpowder cut with sawdust. Mm. Um, so this idea is actually a notion we stole from uh, English common law. And, and uh, we joke about being cheeky Americans. And now I'm here in the United Kingdom trying to sell it back to them as our own. But at least I give them the attribution. But yes, it's been around in the United States uh, since the Civil War. And it was reinvigorated back in 1986 during uh, a, a similar time with the defense industry buildup. And there were um, lots of allegations about unscrupulous defense contractors selling $800 toilet seats and $600 hammers to the Defense Department. So maybe let's get back to the False Claims Act because that might be super relevant as I'm thinking about it right now um, with regards to things like hand sanitizer and, and whatnot um, as big tech is sort of trying to control um, uh, fraud, fraudulent things being sold online. But but. We'll get to you know COVID whistleblowers 
in a moment, but I thought maybe if you could just give us some stats to start off with um, for sure. those who don't know much about sort of the world of whistleblowing. Sure, sure. So what's interesting is that in um, in the world of whistleblowing, we started with the False Claims Act back in the Civil War, but because of the success of the False Claims Act, because as many Justice Department officials will tell you, whistleblowers are their number one enforcement tool, because there's no substitute for having a well-placed insider who can basically provide a roadmap to the prosecutors of the fraud. Um, you can, you can, um, do your investigations from the outside all day long, but all it takes is one um, well-placed insider to basically deliver the goods to the prosecutor. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. And the statistics have shown that from 1986, when, it, when the act was amended until 2019, when we last recorded our statistics, over $51 billion have been recovered by the Treasury as a result of cases initiated by whistleblowers. So what's mm. so interesting about that, it's a big number. And mm. I love to talk about it here in the UK a lot, where we're also trying to incentivize the, the parliament to take a similar approach. And I say, what would you do with your relative equivalent of $51 billion? You could fund NHS with those kind of dollars that it's just, it's just really indispensable in helping um, get back um, fraud monies that have been taken by fraud, waste, and abuse. Mm, well, then maybe there'll be more receptive years over the next year or two in the UK. Yeah. Given, given well, how the NHS is doing right now, perhaps. Um, why? Why would one whistleblow? Because uh, it could kill you. And I know the New Yorker did a profile of, of you and some of your clients, and in fact, one of them did die. This is true. Um, why, you know, why would you whistleblow? I think a lot of whistleblowers will tell you a couple things mm -hmm. that some for some of them, it's not even a conscious choice. For some of them, they don't even know that they're a whistleblower until they start being treated like a pariah. So for a lot of people, it's just doing their job. If you're head of audit at a huge defense contractor or in a big financial services company, and you are basically giving the unwelcome news that because of something that's happened, because of an accounting error, because of whatever, you're now not going to be making your quarterly earnings statement. Then all of a sudden you've been told, you know what, even though you've had great performance reviews, we just think you're not a team player anymore. And so it's sort of these, it's the reaction to whistleblowers that make them all of a sudden say, wait a minute, I had great performance reviews, but all of a sudden when I started to speak up, suddenly it's clear that there's something going on. So that's just my point of saying that a lot of whistleblowers don't even know that they are whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a difficult and daunting um, undertaking. If you do know that you're consciously going to be doing it, we often talk about um, the fact that it is a, it's not just a whistleblower's decision in many ways, because it's a life changing and can be a life ch changing and altering event. Um, it should be more of a family decision. I, the, the amount of ways in which um, whistleblowers are retaliated against across sector, it doesn't matter what industry, it tends to be um, uniform, whether it's healthcare or defense, um, they're treated this, or national intelligence whistleblowers, they're all treated the same. We sort of say that, that employers, be they government or private contractors, have an autoimmune response to whistleblowers. They're going to expel them. Mm. And we like to say that whistleblowers are the good bacteria um, that you need in your system that actually help you to be healthy. And in fact, there's some fantastic data recently coming out of George Washington University and the University of Utah that took data um, from one of the country's top whistleblower, internal whistleblower reporting hotline provider. They anonymized the data and they showed that companies that have internal hotlines that are encouraging whistleblowers to speak up, the more people are calling, the healthier the company. Which so seems so to be the bottom line, right? That's what you're trying to say is for the CEOs and management, they should actually welcome a whistleblower and it'll be good for the bottom line long term. 
Right. Because once if you we say it's like being the parent of a teenager, that if they're not talking to you, if your employees aren't talking to you, you're not going to be able to deal with the situation until it's metastasized and become a, a, a brand and public relations fiasco. If they're talking to you, then they're telling you in real time from the small things to the big things about what's going on and you can fix them. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to see a cultural change around the perception of whistleblowers as liabilities to whistleblowers being assets. Unfortunately, now, because of this great research, we can show that companies that have encouraged speak up and have active lines or actually have fewer lawsuits, fewer um, enforcement actions taken mm -hmm. against them. So whistleblowers are allies. But remember, the term whistleblower back not too long ago was synonymous with snitch and tattletale. Do you think culturally it's different? I mean, you're in London now and I grew up in Scotland and uh, now I maybe given the current pandemic, things will change, but I, I sense there's maybe a little bit of a difference between a whistleblower in the UK and in the U S are they a little bit more celebrated in the U S than in the UK or, there's, or not? There's certainly, I think they're, they're certainly celebrated in the U S in terms of and a couple Hollywood. Of, <laughs> in terms of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood celebrates them, that's for sure. Um, they are also recognized by the fact that our whistleblower programs, unlike the United Kingdom programs, actually pay whistleblowers a reward for if in certain instances, if the information they provide to the government helps them to basically enforce a fine, have a successful prosecution. So it's those monies that sometimes are sort of are fundamental and instrumental in making and helping a whistleblower reach the tipping point in a decision to say, it's a crazy thing to be a whistleblower. I'm likely to be blacklisted. So why would I undertake that risk? I'm doing it and whistleblowers typically blow the whistle in the public interest, something that is benefits all of us, yet that one individual bears all the risk. So because of that, inequality, it seemed the, the whistleblower reward system was put in place to recognize that basically it's really the net present value of the career loss that you may suffer. Um, so that's the fundamental way in which the American programs differ from the UK programs. But culturally, if you tell, and I have for the past three years being in London, when I tell um, British people to a person during the first few years when I said, oh yeah, I'm an American whistleblower lawyer. And they say uniformly, you said that you guys pay people <laughs> regulation. We're British, we do it because it's the right thing to do. You mercenary Americans have to be paid to do the right thing. But then when you, when you wind that back, because obviously there's a lot of cultural baggage with that. Americans are seen as overly litigious, mercenary, capitalism unchecked, right? Mm -hmm. So when you wind it back and say, but think about what whistleblowers suffer um, and say, would you, if you were faced in that position, you're young, you trained your whole career to be in finance and all of a sudden you're going to take that step and you have a fit young family and you may never work in what you've been trained to do. Are you going to do that without a safety net in the form of a reward? Mm -hmm. And when you it that way, then it gets traction. So we have to be very careful in the UK and how we talk. We don't call it rewards here or God forbid bounties because that's what we call them in the United States because we're all pirates. Our attorney generals traditionally um, in favor. I know our current one might not be in favor of whistleblowers, but um, is there... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there a trend one way or another on, on with attorney generals, I suppose, both at the national and the state state level? It's a great question. Um, attorney General Barr um, mm -hmm. was very strongly questioned during his confirmation hearings with the Senate because he was actually a vocal critic against the False Claims Act. Right. right. So he spent a lot of time saying, can you uphold this law? Would that be something that you're able to do given your other remarks? And he said yes. Um, so yes, there can be, and we scrutinize that, um, which is interesting to me because it should be, and part of I think what you're getting at is it should be a bipartisan issue. Like right. who's pro, who's pro fraud? It should come from the top, you would think. Yeah. Right. Who who wants taxpayer dollars to be absconded with? None of us do. And so when you go both sides of the aisle, Republicans like the idea of privatizing government, and that's what 
the rewards are doing. They're giving an, a financial incentive, not just to the whistleblower, um, but they're also giving financial incentive to the law firms to provide resources to understaffed and underworked prosecutors. So that's a that's part of what um, the, the Republicans tend, and this is all grossly stereotypically, but tend to appreciate that element is a, bringing some private industry and private incentive to the government process to assist the pro prosecutors and help them along. Of course, on the other side of the aisle, Democrats love um, you know, accountability and trying to hold big corporations accountable. So there has always been um, very good bilateral uh, bipartisan support for the False Claims Act. I think Attorney General Barr is a bit of an aberration. Okay. Um, but he's he seems to be towing the line, uh, we're hoping. <laughs> okay. Let's um let's dive into our current times and mm -hmm. and COVID. And um I guess let's start off with the the doctor ophthalmologist in China who was the whistleblower there. Like when when was that? Back in, in January or beforehand, they were chatting on WeChat, I think, right? There was that's right. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, Can you so can you give us the background on it? And things have certainly changed us in the last few weeks on that front. Absolutely. I was, I've been saying that, um, and I think I said this in LA, that it's an unprecedented time, unprecedented time for whistleblowers and whistleblower lawyers, um, because it wasn't that long ago when we were just talking about the Ukraine whistleblower. Um, right. And now we've moved very quickly that at the, at the very beginning and the inception of the Wuhan COVID crisis, we have a whistleblower. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important to celebrate. Um, doc his name is Dr. Li Wenliang, and he was an ophthalmologist, and he was among many. And in fact, I think he starts out in a typical whistleblower path that I don't think he intended to be a whistleblower originally. He was kind of outed. So there was a doctor at the Wuhan Central Hospital who started to see a patient that was showing SARS-like um, um, symptoms. And so she sent out the pictures and some scans and the patient medical record to a group of her peers. And it made its way to Dr. Lee Vin Yang. And he started to send it to his peers. So in WeChat, he sent just to his medical school colleagues, his buddies, a couple of comments about how this was concerning to him. Um, and those got leaked. And so when those got leaked to the broader public, um, he was clearly, um, I don't know that outed, but he, it, it, there were a lot of actions being taken because as soon as these people started, as soon as these WeChats were being looked at, the Chinese police started to call these people rumor mongers and going after them for basically trying to quelch this notion and saying it was all false, what they were saying was false. Mm -hmm. um, and then later he takes the decision. So then he's sort of been put out there in the public domain. And this is, believe it or not, this was December 30th is the first time that he puts the WeChats up. And then a month later, he um, takes an, an unusual step of um, basically on social media, what went viral and how we all got to know him is he explained how the police treated him and admonishing him for this behavior. So he made a conscious choice at that point to be uh, the type of whistleblower who wanted the world to know that the Chinese government was trying to silence um, doctors who were trying to sound the alarms and get the alert there early so that people um, could take the adequate precautions. And, and they were using WeChat, but also um, sort of creating like languages that don't exist so that censors couldn't you right. know, get through censors and using different emoticons. Um, can you talk to technology being used and how technology yeah. is being used? Um, uh, beyond uh, signal and everyone should be using signal for sure. Signal for <laughs> all all right. sorts of on mail. These are all the things. So yeah, yeah the, that's a lot of the technology that's used to give whistleblowers confidence that the information they're trying to share will be encrypted and won't be um, hacked into. But what's interesting right now is that there's a whole movement that's all a WikiLeaks kind of where a lot of journalists are using a new technology, not so new, but fairly new, um, where there is two-way anonymous reporting that's allowed. Because remember for whistleblowers, because the stakes are so high, they are a very cautious bunch. And so- They're very what? They're a very cautious bunch. So they- Oh, oh, oh yeah. 
we will often want to test the waters. And so they will, back in the days before we had email, journalists or whistleblower lawyers would just get a white envelope on your desk and um, left outside your door. And now with these two-way anonymous reporting systems, you can send, you can start contacting a reporter and then uploading documents to them all using an anonymous um, platform. So that has given confidence and it actually allows the whistleblower and the journalist to engender some sort of trust. And so while someone will initially start out wanting to be anonymous as they go along and as the sort of they're seeing that they're corroborated and they're able to have the back and forth with the journalists or the lawyers because lawyers use similar platforms. And ultimately they may decide to take that step. We at least can guide them and give them give them answers to questions like what protections would I have if I did take this step? Mm. So this technology is very much aiding um, the more cautious whistleblowers who want to remain anonymous to first start, you know, flirting with the idea of bringing the information forward. Mm. Um, and then whistleblowers in the U.S. since COVID has come out here, there was one in Health and Human Services for the first responders. Where do things stand on, on that front? And has anything moved forward? Maybe give a little bit of background. Yeah, I mean, I find that one to be fascinating that we we have two whistleblowers. We have a whistleblower in China. And I think it's really important to also say with Dr. Ven Lang that he um, ultimately passed away. Oh, um, yeah, we didn't, yeah, we didn't from, finish the story. There. And has been from, pardoned, right, very recently? Is that yeah. a PR campaign? I, you know, I, don't, I, can, I definitely don't think that had he not passed away, that he would not have been absolved of, of, right. the, of the admonishments and fines that he was being um, exposed to. So, you know, he, he passed away at 33 years old. Um, he was treating a, a patient. A young person to die. Very, very, very young. And I think the question was that he had seen a patient who'd been in the seafood market and had had a very high viral load of covid 19 and that mm -hmm. that was what sort of overtook him was somehow the 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 severity of the amount that he was exposed to so mm -hmm. at the same time so but i think so interesting is that with dr van lang and now with our hhs whistleblower both of them are doing something similar which is they're trying to shine a light on in adequate, ineffective government responses. Mm. Um, and so at the same time as, as um, we're all as a, as a global community starting to see that Wuhan is um, experiencing this unprecedented uh, virus and it's spreading really rapidly, what happens in the United States is that there are a bunch of planes that are coming into the United States in early, end of January, early February that are coming from Wuhan province. There are a bunch of evacuees from Wuhan and they go to two- Those were Americans coming back into the US. So just uh, folks working over there or diplomats or- Yep, yep. Okay. And so there are two big planes. And what happens is the, the US response is they obviously have to quarantine them. And so there were some two sets of employees from the Department of Health and Human Services who typically are the type of people who only respond to natural disasters. So they respond to people coming who are refugees coming because of fires, famines. They are not typically dealing with health situations. They were deployed. Not trained, not trained appropriately. So exactly, and they were deployed um, to both of those air bases. And what was extraordinary is that they were not given adequate training or equipment. So they were they were not given um, any of the protective gear. And so at many times they were in the hangars, meeting face to face, giving advice and help on how we're going to logistically keep them quarantined. At the same time as CDC employees are standing right next to them in full hazmat gear they're standing talking face to face with these same people who are could be potentially infected are there any I, photos from this period that have uh, leaked out to the press i i haven't we seen have it. not we have not seen it but the whistleblower interestingly um not unlike how dr ben liang was treated whistleblower is a fairly high ranking senior woman at hhs um and she was quite quickly and um uh, aggressively retaliated against. So it's that, you know, it's this, it's this almost visceral reaction that I'm saying that employ that it's sort of this shoot the messenger idea um, yeah. that we've been seeing time and time again. But no, so what she saw and what her employees were reporting to her 
was, you know, really scary things, which is that not only the, if the impact of them not being trained meant that these people were going home at night to their families after having been on the base. A few of them were flying home after being in the air bases on commercial airliners. Um, so it's just that there was no protection for those employees or consideration for um, the, you know, the wider public that we were going to allow this to spread. Mm. For those who are just joining us, I'm speaking to Mary Inman, who is a whistleblower attorney um, with Constantine Cannon. Mary, what's your email address? If there are any whistleblowers who are listening and want to reach out to you. <laughs> sure. So my email address is my first initial last name. So Minmin at ConstantineCannon.com. So C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T-I-N-E-C-A-N-N-O-N.com. Great. And um, for, for anyone who has questions for Mary, we'll, we'll get to them um, very soon, but just uh, throw them in on whatever uh, network, whether it's Facebook or, or YouTube, um, that you're, you're watching this right now. Uh, so should there be a coronavirus task force with regards to whistleblowers? Do you anticipate... Um, I mean, there's got to be a ton of violations that are gonna gonna suddenly crop up with regards to the False Claims Act, um, whether that's everywhere, right? I mean, you read my, you you read my mind. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what is needed. We didn't talk right? about this, so I'm glad. I'm glad you think it's. <laughs> there's it is really, bad. it's really important. Um, You're gonna be very I'm, busy, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really important. And what's so interesting is on Sunday, we saw the Department of Justice issuing a temporary restraining order, the first of what we will see being many scam artists trying to profiteer on the crisis, which is incredibly despicable and odious behavior. In this case, there was, it was a website um, trying to create bogus vaccines and trying to sell bogus vaccines. So that's precisely why we need a task force is that, as we've seen, Congress is trying to mobilize with the president to enact a number of bills. And, and you know, there's been $8 billion accounted for treating and and dealing with the disease. Um, and that's gonna be the first of many bills. So in terms of a task force, yes, I think it's imperative that we have one. And I think part of what we would be looking for is to make sure that there is there are adequate um, measures in place of gatekeepers to protect the dollars and make sure that the money's earmarked actually get where they're supposed to go. Um, we saw something similar in Katrina and actually also in the housing crisis. Um, where there was um, a lot of money earmarked and that there were gr uh, groups called TARP and other government projects that were there to try and make sure that it wasn't, um, you know, that they, they were allocated properly. So I think we need to do similar things here and the False Claims Act will be just like it was with Katrina and the mortgage and housing crisis. There were untold number of whistleblowers who brought information forward that told us about unscrupulous contractors who were in the case of Katrina, manipulating um, insurance claims to line their own pockets and similarly with the housing crisis. So I think you know, we're looking at certain areas like telehealth and there's been a huge amount of money um, to appropriately allocated to doctors to treat um, treat um, their patients using um, email and, and video like we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's just as soon as the money flows, it creates a very fertile ground for fraud. Mm. There's a question from Gemma Milne. I'm a journalist on academic science fraud. Do you think this reward system could work for this kind of whistleblowing when there isn't a corporate direct financial qualification around it? Yes, it's interesting that we, we have found with the False Claims Act, there are a number of cases that deal with um, grant fraud. So when the government is giving grants to scientists, um, so NIH fraud, there's been a number of great cases that whistleblowers have been really important. They're typically scientists like yourself um, who are uh, exposing the fact that the NIH monies were not being used um, and that the research was somehow uh, compromised or um, they're making false allegations. So we, we can do that. And we do. We've, we've had um, a number of, of good whistleblowers in that space. Mm. What are journalists' ethical obligations to confidential sources and whistleblowers in the digital age of surveillance capitalism, to use Shoshana Zuboff's 
term. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there's a marvelous um, there's a marvelous nonprofit called the Signals Network um, that is per is designed to actually help train media organizations to deal responsibly with whistleblowers. Okay. Um, and part of the issue is that whistleblowers, of course, at the time that can you pick, you have to put yourself in a whistleblower's shoes. They are an extremist. When they come to a source, they typically have tried, the data shows at least three times internally to get their um, employer to correct. Them. I mean, the whistleblower who's at Boeing, whose name I've forgotten, um, he's very I open about it. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, he's, uh, that's very well documented. He, he like retired, you know, and he kept on trying to reach out. And that's the and that's the typical scenario is okay. that they try repeatedly internally to, to correct it because they don't want to lose their job and sideline their career. They just want to keep going about their job. And it's only when they are ignored repeatedly and repeatedly, and then there's public health concerns that are weighing. And it's not just a question about financial misdealings. Often, in the case of Boeing, there are concerns about the traveling safety of the traveling public. So then he goes to the regulators. Then they go to the government. Um, so it's not the first port of call. The first port of call for a whistleblower is typically um, to try and correct it internally. And so when they can't, as in Ed Pearson's case, when you don't have the ear of Boeing and you don't hear the ear of the FAA, then you ultimately go to the New York Times. Um, but remember that whistleblowers, that's, a, that's an extraordinarily extreme step because Ed Pearson at that point and when he goes to the New York Times is unknown to the world. Mm. And so he's now going to be making a decision where he has to step front and center into the spotlight. And he ultimately did to all of our benefit by being in the Senate hearings, talking about the 737 Max and showing the information that he knew from his time working in the plants um, and in the Seattle area that that this was a hardware problem, not just a software problem with 737 MAX. Mm. Creon says, meanwhile, the NIH has tried quite, unsuccess quite successfully to ruin the scientific and medical careers of those who try to bring um, you know, different situations to light. And that's why in this task force that we're talking about needing for COVID-19 and the money's earmarked for it is that that's the problem. We need to have baked into the legislation that is, is allocating this money to have protections for whistleblowers because that's what happens. That's the knee jerk response that we see. And it's only with adequate protections um, that a whistleblower can then have a claim and say, you know, I was retaliated against, not because, you know, that I wasn't creating my expense reports correctly, or in the case of the HHS whistleblower, she ultimately just got reassigned to a position that mm. it was completely out of nowhere. Um, so you, you need to have those protections in place. Mm. Alex says, Mary, how do you choose what whistleblower cases to take on? How do you find your, your, your new clients? <laughs> so, um, a lot Sometimes of you seek them out, you read about them in the press. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think part of the reason I'm done, is a good example of that, I think, with you, right? <laughs> I think, uh, as part of the reason I'm talking to you today, is that <laughs> I think behind every crisis and fraud, if you look hard enough, you'll find a whistleblower. Um, so we're at an unprecedented time, but I think that's always been the case. So how do I find them? I mean, a lot of what we do and a lot of um, how do I decide which ones to take really deal with me putting myself in the shoes of the prosecutors who ultimately I'm going to be trying to convince to bring the case. So um, the cases that are the easiest to decide are ones where public health is at stake. Those are ones, it's like a triage board. So the Boeing type situations, the Theranos type situation. And Theranos, obviously investors were harmed. There was the added issue, of course, that false test results. Where does were that stand now, the Theranos case? It's sort of lost so, um, it right now. The criminal trial for Elizabeth Holmes yeah. is upcoming. So what? It's, it's coming up. Oh, it's coming up. That'll be exciting. So um, it's been quiet for a while, and I think it's going to take center stage again. So we'll see. Oh, Wait, yeah. What is the timing on that? I don't have the exact timing, but I think, you know, I don't know that there's been a specific date set. But it, I, it, there definitely are a lot of noises about people mm. coming to testify. Do you think um, journalists should be embedded in terms of whistleblowing? So that's... I think that's a very difficult 
uh, question. And I think <laughs> I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure that that's really where we need to be because I think honestly, the best information comes um, not sort of in that kind of a gotcha environment, right. but from people who are, that's part of where I think the process, a lot of this has to do with the credibility of the whistleblower. So you can imagine when a prosecutor knows that a whistleblower stands to financially benefit, they want to look and scrutinize that person and get and look at their evidence. And of course, for, you know, all of our clients that we represent, these are people who uncovered this in the course of their jobs. Um, and then, you know, we're not want you know not wanting to do not wanting to go directly to the government wanting it to be corrected internally and i think there's something about the natural evolution of that process that is i think is much preferred mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um let's see i think what am i thinking about right now what where are you um you're in london right now can we talk about what your situation is there like moving sure. away from whistleblowing <laughs> sure. um what's london right right like right now well it's really interesting um london has today we just um moved to lockdown so we're sort of in a position that san francisco is in i came out of nowhere too i mean i think i was listening i always listen to the bbc um, streaming live as all of my friends know it was like whoa all of a sudden one day it was like things changed like that over there yeah it felt much it felt sort of gradual in terms of Boris Johnson would, would do a daily message and it felt like last week like every day something was slowly being shut down but it was ramping down very slowly and and I think ultimately leading up to today where it's everything nothing but non-essential businesses so we're right near London Bridge and on a high street and so there I, literally i look out my window i can see two pubs and our our um, patisserie our bakery and where do you oh, yeah you live you live near the um financial district right ish yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. it was really notable to me that um yesterday we started to see lines at the bakery which of course is problematic right because you shouldn't have more than and they were not observing the two meter rule um, and I think that's meanwhile precise. the bakery is like, oh my god, finally, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, it's like so, down with Tesco, up with the like the, the corner bakery. <laughs> so I think that was the sad part for us. Is that such a staple of our neighborhood? Um, but it felt appropriate, and I think this is where we're at. We we are obviously we see everyone's watching Italy. Um, but no one wants an Italy situation. And so I was actually relieved. And I think it makes sense that we got to the place that we're at, um, which is that it's very strong words. When you close pubs in London, when you close pubs in England, I think that's, I don't think that's ever happened before. Um, yeah. they, take was, the, they take the country's soul away from them. Cause that's certainly, I've only been here for three years and I, I love a pub. It just seems like, you know, we should be playing taps. Have you um, had any changes in your home life as a result? How many people do you have in your house right now? <laughs> so my husband works from home anyway, so he's super excited. To he's have super stoked. He's like, no, got company every day. And <laughs> he's been uh, very gracious in teaching us the ways of working from home. I have two teenage boys. That's not as easy. Uh -huh. um, but it's actually are been you homeschooling on the side. Are they doing <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, their schools have been actually pretty effective with remote learning. So we've been lucky. I know that, you know, I think the big challenge here, of course, is that not everyone has great Wi-Fi access or right. computer or tech. Oh, to do wow. it. So like, just so I know in some places, schools are actually handing out hotspots and other things to students to help sort of um, level the playing field. But yeah, it's, it's extraordinary times. Yeah. I was going to ask if you had any nature notes. I feel like everyone, um, so many people I know have nature notes. Like I suddenly have hummingbirds. I live in an extremely industrial area and uh, yeah, I've got hummingbirds coming in all around. I mean, I have a garden in a way that I never had before, but that just might be because it's nice. My, <laughs> my nature notes is we have a rooftop where we sit many evenings and we are right in the flight paths of both Gatwick oh, and- Oh, so nice. So peaceful. 
And it is so it's for the first time in three years from our being here. It's the first time that you you won't see them. You know, they were steady clip, like every couple minutes there's a plane. Oh wow. Okay. And now it's yeah, it's very quiet, very quiet. Yeah. It's, it's all terrible, but there's um, certainly some bright moments if you can just pause to enjoy them, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, there's a couple more questions, and then I think we'll wrap up. Um, another from, from Gemma Mills, and she says, if you don't mind commenting again on science fraud, a lot of academic fraud isn't technically illegal, e.g. Photoshopping images and papers. How to hold it account if it's not through a court? I don't know if that's uh, interesting. I mean, I think you could have the universities themselves um, and the institutions themselves can have and should have whistleblowing um, um, procedures and policies. And they should, in fact, be sending the signal and rewarding whistleblowers for bringing that information forward. So I think there's things that can be done. Um, I know that that, you know, we have a long way to go before we get there. But I think we are slowly starting to see the cultural change and recognizing that whistleblowers need um, to be heard and are, are your allies. So I would think that you could see um, having the institutions have policies and procedures in place um, to bring the whistleblowers, uh, to allow them a place and a vehicle. And of course, if that doesn't work, then that's, that's the problem that we get into, that mm -hmm. we don't have enough whistleblower programs um, you know, the ones I'm talking about only deal with if there have been federal funds that have been um, absconded with, or if, as we talk about the SEC programs, their agency goals are being undermined. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we would need to see a similar program to what the SEC and the CFTC and the IRS has. You could have an, I an, an NA NIH program or related program that um, bring, allows whistleblowers and gives them an office of the whistleblower clearly signposted that whistleblowers can bring that information forward and that that agency needs to act upon it. So I think it would be a legislative fix is my long way of saying it. And mm -hmm. that may seem far-fetched, but we've seen because of the success of the SEC program, the Department of Transportation has just adopted a whistleblower reward program. Um, so it's sort of spreading. So I wouldn't think it's that hard to jump to an to envision an NIH type um, program as well. Uh, mm. um, there's a question from a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. Is it a dream scenario or is it more of a nightmare when a journalist starts sniffing around on a big whistleblower case? that you're working on, but maybe in your case, I know with Theranos, it was the other way around. You saw something in the Wall Street Journal and then you approached right. the whistleblower. Do it's you want to explain the background on that as, as like a final it, story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a nightmare. In fact, it can be, we work very collaboratively with the press. Um, so the, the dividing line really tends to be where the state of the investigation is going on with the government. So we're bringing the information through our whistleblowers to the government. And obviously we can't have press that compromises their law enforcement efforts. Um, but at a certain point in time, the, the press is very welcome and well deployed. It's just, it has to be orchestrated. There has to be a lot of synchronized efforts between the two at the right, at the right time. Um, the press can be incredibly powerful and is welcome to us, honestly. Um, but in to reference the Theranos story, in fact, it was because of um, John Carreyrou, the Wall Street Journal reporter, who broke the story when everyone else thought Elizabeth Holmes was the darling of Silicon Valley. He was the first to put a black eye there. I that very long. I mean, there were so many long pieces of her, like in the New Yorker, and oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, everyone wanted, you know, wanted they to wanted see a woman in Silicon Valley wearing black turtlenecks. <laughs> yeah, we wanted a female Steve Jobs. We didn't get her, though, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> yeah, so I think that that is what happened there was that we, in particular, read the story about Tyler Schultz and saw that, you know, the heart wrenching part of the fact that, you know, he was going individually as it's him sort of David versus Goliath going up against Boy Schiller, who basically jumped him and served him with a, a restraining order. Um, 
at his grandfather's house that he's then incurred over $400,000 in attorney's fees trying to defend against um, basically what they were trying to say is a violation. He'd violated their trade secret and other um, documents that he'd signed. And he famously said that trade uh, fraud is not a trade secret, which I think is is lovely. But how we came to approach him was that we were reading that story and recognizing that he may not have appreciated at that point that he might be an SEC qualified to be a whistleblower under the SEC program. So it was thanks to a reporter yeah. um, that we came to ultimately eventually become connected to Tyler Schultz. Mm. Well, thank you so much for those um, who just tuned in in the last 10 or 15 minutes. I'm talking to Mary Inman. She's a whistleblower attorney at Constantine Cannon. Uh, if any of you want to get in touch with her, we'll, we'll put your email, Mary, um, on the various feeds, but do you want to give it to us one more time for folks? Sure, you, can you can find me on Twitter at Mary Inman 94. That's mm. probably one of the easiest ways to find me. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, but my email is minmin, M-N-Min at ConstantineCannon.com. Great. Thank you so much. And, and for those of you who are watching, we would love any ideas of, of other topics and people to whom we should be speaking. And yeah, we're going to uh, do this every day or maybe every other day. We're trying every day this week, which is... Um, enthusiastic. It's like Terry Gross without the, the NPR team behind it, realize. <laughs> um, there's definitely a lot of reading, a lot of reading involved. Um, tomorrow, I'm talking to Nelson Schwartz, who is a business and economics reporter at the New York Times. And he has a new book that just came out, I think it was last week, called The Velvet Rope Economy, which is fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed that. On Thursday, I'm going to talk to Daniel Handler, who's also known as Lemony Snicket. Do you know him, Mary? Yeah. Have you read the books your kids? Yeah, San Francisco. I love him. Don't. Yeah. Definitely, definitely tune in. He's a, yeah. you definitely have to talk to him about his amazing um, orchestral piece, The, the Composer is Dead. Oh, okay. Well, we might need you to join in and co-host. <laughs> oh, I, I definitely be asking questions. On the, on the okay. okay, great. And um, I'm also a co-host that day is going to be Zach Williams. And we're going to start doing something weekly on the, the very large sandbox of mental health and looking after ourselves, which seems to be a good time to be bringing up that topic. And then on Friday this week, um, I'm going to talk to economists uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton. Um, he won the Nobel in 2015 for economics, and they have a new book coming out. And then um, Liam from the Hot House Flowers is going to perform live Woo! in Ireland, which should be uh, a ton of fun. And and then next week, yeah, we're just putting together the schedule. So if you have any suggestions, uh, please let me know. So thank you so much. Please share this. And, and give us, um, yeah, any suggestions of how we can when, make it better would be really, really great. So thank you, Mary. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Be well, shut-ins. Be well. <laughs>